But I want to start this conversation picking up on what you said by saying that when I became Orthodox, something tripped in my mind. It was like a switch mm. tripped in my mind. When I opened the door of uh, the church I go to, St. Octarius, I call it a cathedral in a sense. It's not a boxy auditorium. Uh, which often points people to humanity as opposed to a cathedral that points mm. people to God. But when I opened that door at the cathedral, something switched, tripped in my brain, and, and, and it was, I'm not here for an extravaganza. Mm. I'm not here for a show. I'm here to worship God. And that was a seminal point in, in, in my life, in, in, in my own transformation recognizing that worship is not this warm, fuzzy feeling uh, that you get when you see a fantastic uh, musical rendition performed in a church or you hear a magnificent oration. Uh, we are created to worship God, and until we uh, find our all in Him, we remain empty. So I want, I want to talk about this, not just in an abstract sense, but to tie it together like KP did, uh, talking about people leaving the church because they see the church as another iteration of Disney World um, as opposed to a place to worship God. But when they recognize that there's something mystical going on in the church, that you're pointing them to the very thing that their heart aches for, the worship of God, that those people that are leaving, Generation Z, the millennial generation, etc., all of a sudden they want to come back. And I have seen this personally, not to draw attention to myself, but when I became Orthodox, so many people became Orthodox as well, and they when I ask them why, they tell me the same thing. The mystical, the, uh, the mysteries, the antinomies, the worship, all of that attracted them mm -hmm. uh, to come back into the church. And so we could talk about people leaving the church and dollar, uh, donor dollars. Uh, all, we can also talk about the fact that when people recognize that there's something more, mm -hmm. uh, they will come back to the church, and then they will recognize what it means to partake in the divine nature. So let me, let me draw on something in my own experience. So uh, I had mentioned that I, I had, before discovering orthodoxy, had abandoned, rejected uh, Christianity as far as I knew it. Right? I only knew about Catholicism and Protestantism. And I studied it fervently, but I thought it was all nonsense. Uh, and I had constructed this new theology, right? My, a theology of my own, a religion of my own making, composed of the God of the philosophers and so on. But one of the, I don't know if I've ever even told you this, Hank, one of my favorite books back then was the book of Leviticus. Mm. You did tell me this, yes. And... It's a strange thing, right? You know, who, who likes the book of Leviticus? It's, but I thought it was... When you told me that, I asked you to leave my house. <laughs> That's right. That's, so something is deeply wrong with this individual, uh, which is probably true. But, it's, uh, <laughs> but I was fascinated by two things. One was that I was, had an opportunity to read an ancient priest manual, right? There was something mysterious about being able to peer into a text that exists for the sole purpose of instructing ancient priests in how to approach a god who was fascinating, terrifying, mm -hmm. mysterious, transcendent, present though. Right? He wasn't an abstract god of the philosophers. He was personal, but also terrifying in many ways, but also fascinating, loving, all these sorts of things. He was dynamic. And so uh, I, was, I was fascinated by that and on, on the one hand. On the other hand, I was also drawn into it because I looked at it and I said, I don't know what true religion looks like. 
I really don't. But I have an inkling that this is if that this it might look something like this. But what I lamented is I said it's unfortunate that I can't find this anywhere anymore. And that's why my first experience at a divine liturgy where I walked in as somebody who had obsessed over these ancient practices and I started to see the continuity of worship that you referred to, KP. I was bowled over. I mean, I had all sorts of questions, but that was one of the things that just arrested me because I thought, this is something that I pined over, right? You know, I, 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 I looked at it and I, I longed for something like this, right? I was drawn into it and I said, true worship must look something like this. Holiness, right, must look something like this. But it's unfortunately a, a dead ancient practice. Nobody does that anymore. And then I saw it. And that was the first thing that fascinated me. Now, I do want to say here, and, and I, I want to draw this back to the energies and something that we've talked about. Um, on the one hand, we've talked very abstractly about the energies. Uh, and I want to talk on sort of a practical level about it, because you had said it's not just an abstraction, it's practical. And KP, you talked about things that are on that practical level. But if I can sort of draw some of those things together, there's this tendency sometimes when talking about the evolution of this doctrine and the distinction, there are analogies that are helpful, right? We've talked about some of these analogies, musician analogies, uh, participation analogies, fire metal, all those sorts of things. And conceptually, it makes sense. But sometimes there's a tendency to think about divine energies as something that has to be fantastical, mm. right? It has to be that the person is glowing mm -hmm. or raising the dead, as opposed to recognize a very important thing. The way um, the West in general has used, and by the West I don't just mean Christians, I mean philosophers as well, has used attributes. When talking about attributes of God, God's omniscient, he's omnipotent. They mean properties of the divine essence, kind of like the way a triangle has three sides. But the way the Eastern Fathers use attributes, they actually mean the energies. And so they actually do not say God is essentially omniscient or omnipotent or just or loving or good or merciful. They mean that his justice refers to his operative power of doing justice. His omniscience is an activity of knowing the things that he makes. His presence is an activity of being present, everywhere present and filling all things. His love is an activity of showing love toward creatures. It's rooted in his essence, mm. Mm. but those are expressions of that essence. Mm. They are not attributes. Yeah. And the reason that's so important is because when you consider that and you now start to talk about partaking of the divine nature, participating in the energies, now what you arrive at is the idea that when I see someone who is hungry and I feed them, mm. that is me participating in the mm. divine energies. Mm. And I think, for example, uh, Father Roman, he's, a, he's now deceased, I'm sure he'll be a canonized saint, but I had the opportunity to hear him before I was Orthodox at a monastery. And this was a man who was tortured for years uh, in Romania. Mm. And Everyone revered him as, as a living saint. And he came and he spoke to me and other people that I'd brought with. And he said, sin is hard. He said, the passion, passions are difficult. They're tyrannical. They always want more. Mm. To serve them is very difficult. He said, salvation is easy. A cup of cold water to somebody who's thirsty. Mm. A piece of bread to somebody who's hungry. And while that might sound in this sort of Protestant framework while well, he's talking about work salvation mm. or something like that. Mm. To Father Roman, he's talking about the very simplicity that when you engage in something as simple as feeding the hungry, you are actually doing the work of God. You are being energized by God. You are co-workers with God. It is a synergistic act. And that concept of synergy is so important because it's not just that I'm doing it, and I'm doing it out of obedience for God, so you don't really get God, he's over there telling me to do it, and now I do it. Rather, the concept of synergy, God is present and eminent within that act. One of you know, my favorite analogies for explaining this is, if we talk about, you know, we use the fire metal analogy for a minute, and we say, well, we take a branding iron now instead, 
and we heat it up to the point that it's glowing and it's burning. I take it over to a cow and I press it and I brand the cow. How distant does the fire seem to that cow? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty present. But at the same time, it's a synergistic act because the reason the fire is eminently present is because of the conduit that's carrying over to it. But the conduit also shapes the act. That's why there's that shape to it, because that's the shape of the conduit. And so there's a real sense in which when KP does something to me, shows me divine love and kindness, and it's a synergistic act, a cooperative act, it's shaped by KP, but it's also God. And it's not that just that KP is being obedient. KP is quite truly bringing God close. This is actually one of the things, the word mediator in the mm. West, as we've typically associated with a divide, right? I'm, I'm, I've offended KP, Hank, go talk to KP because I can't talk to him. And that's how we tended to think about mediator. But the Greek word for mediator, if you read Pseudo Dionysius, means actually a conduit that brings something and makes mm. it present. And makes an imprint. Yeah. Like the branding iron. That's right. That's right. Well, it's the a, a best explanation that I ever heard or read in understanding this. This is brilliant. You should write a book on this thing. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, people listen to this and they forget, but write, um, this is, I mean, you know, that reminds me of Cornelius, you know, in the book of Acts. You know, he was not a Jew, mm -hmm. and here God sent um, um, the greatest apostle, Saint Peter, saying that go and talk to him that I have seen. And I mean, I always believed this as an orthodox. All human beings are made in the image of God. I must love all people equal, mm -hmm. because God only knows their journey, and you know, this reason I, I mean, during the coronavirus, we have so many um, Hindu uh, brothers and sisters and Muslims gave our bishops and priests uh, millions of um, uh, rupees in money. These are not Christians. They just say, you are doing it. May I help you? And you won't believe I can write a book on this thing. So here they are, although they are not coming to my church, they, they are reflecting the image of God. And that will lead them further into understanding, you know, uh, God in their life, I think. And I, th I, think it's, I think it's part of what you see when Paul says, you know, that some of you, when he's in, in the book of Romans, where he's talking about Jews who have the law but don't do it, will be put to shame by Gentiles who do the law written on their heart. Because there's a real sense in which they are they are greater co-workers with God when they submit mm -hmm. I, to the I, attributes of yeah, God. Yeah, I want to pick up on this um, and, and expand on this because both of you just hit on uh, one of the great, great stumbling blocks and also uh, reasons for making a caricature out of orthodoxy. When I became orthodox, I think both of you remember um, some very famous people uh, were, were, were talking about me becoming uh, orthodox. And, 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 and without naming names, uh, one of them uh, talked about how I joined a church that ought not to be joined, but ought to be cursed. Mm. And the reason he said this is because for him, orthodoxy is a crass system of works righteousness, and that's why it ought to be cursed. It is not salvation by God's grace through faith only or alone. It is a system of works righteousness, and that is to be to be shunned at every corner. Mm -hmm. It has to be combated. Mm -hmm. So what, if, if you look at the, 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 this idea that was debated in the West, uh, with the Protestant Reformation, you had this great debate. I mean, before um, the Protestant Reformation before 1517, you had Tetzel, Johann Tetzel, you know, selling indulgences. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, you had the Pope, Pope Leo X, who excommunicated Luther, who was raising funds to build the ba Basilica at St. Peter's Basilica in, 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 in Rome. And, 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 and so you have this situation arising where Luther is saying, you are making merchandise out of the people of God. And, 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 and then you have the 95 Theses, a lot of which were, 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 were pointed in this direction. And, and then eventually you have this, this false dichotomy arising in the church uh, between faith and works. Mm -hmm. Help us understand, maybe you can begin, help us understand how, um, as as St. James says, as as the body without the spirit is dead, mm -hmm. so faith without works is dead. May I, may I say a word? Um, <clears throat> you know, Jesus said this. Um, you are criticizing me, attacking me. I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. Um, But he can believe me for what I do. Uh, John the Baptist came without eating and drinking, and people said he has a demon. And Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said he is a wine bibber and a gluttonous person. Comma. But wisdom is justified by her children. And um, Hank, you don't, you, you may know this, um, some 20 years ago, 20, at least 15 years ago, it was a dream and imagination I had that someday I will be able to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I did my seminary and I got my degrees and I wrote 270 some books now. And I know the top theologians in the Protestant world in the West, both personally, many of them, and reading books. But I tell you, I never encountered any individual who who is, who got a thousand PhDs in every aspect of theology and Bible and church history and everything like you do. When you became Orthodox, I danced in the room. I said, this I can't believe. Finally, he found his way. I was not talking about knowledge. So I say to people, and I try to get your book to every human being I can you know, send it to, and I tell them, even if for nothing, Hank Heinegraaf being an orthodox is not to gain anything. He lost everything, and it is he found the truth. And so I say to people, people that criticize you or don't understand you, Hank, you are following in the footsteps of Christ himself. And for me, I am one of those privileged people to finally get to see you and know you and learn from you. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Nathan will say that. And um, so people may not believe uh, so much, but you are someone that no one need to imagine that you became what he became because you are ignorant or you don't know the Bible. Or I mean, I have one of the, the top theologians in the United States, Protestant, actually told me personally, when he doesn't know some answers, he calls you. That is 15 years ago. So what I'm saying, and people listen to you and read your writings, I pray that they will think about one thing. If Hank Hanegraaff embraced this, there has to be something about it. And that's, I just want to say that, and obviously you didn't give me any money to say that about you, <laughs> but this is my life journey with you. Mm -hmm. So, but what you did not know also, Hank, you know, Dr. Nathan, there must be, hundreds of thousands of people following um, the Lord because um, they, they never come and tell you but it's happening. Mm. And th that's more important. Mm. Sorry, I... No, I, don't apologize for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, rather than rehashing, um, I mean, I could rehash the, the, the Western discussion about justification, uh, but I think I'd rather... Yeah, I mean, well, okay, I'll rehash it. Just in, a, in the most, in the simplest sense, right? The objection uh, is is that uh, 
Catholicism is turning salvation into something that's by works as opposed to something by grace. And, and the dispute there all has to do with how do we become righteous. And righteous primarily has to do with some sort of judicial standing based on having merits and expunging demerits before God and you know, future judgment. And so the question becomes, is, is that done by God sort of taking away my demerits and imputing to me merits that aren't mine, namely Christ, which would be a sort of Protestant double imputation justification? Or, uh, or does God give me some sort of created grace to help me do things that are meritorious? And then there's other things that help get rid of the, the sins so that I can you know, sort of deal with that and, and bring about merits still by grace, but it's this created grace. Uh, this imminent grace. Uh, but I think, you know, I prefer, rather than saying, well, is orthodoxy, is it by salvation by, by works or by faith? I I, that's sort of a Western debate, it right? Is a Western. I mean, it's a, it's a debate between the Roman Catholics mm -hmm. and the Protestants. That's right. So it's a, a, a debate. Uh, which, which, which really precipitated the the, the Western uh, or, or the, the, the the Western schism of right. the Church, right. not the it's, schism between the East and the West, right. but the schism 500 right. years it's later. Like, right. It's it's an in-house debate, and it's it's one of those debates that there's a real sense in which Catholics and Protestants have more in common with each other than they do with Orthodox, mm -hmm. precisely because they agree, agree on the premises. Yep. They agree that you know, on this issue of merits and demerits and, and, and works and imputations and all that, and they're sort of, they're almost hashing out the details of a, a series of premises that they all agree on. But I think rather than taking the bait of saying, so is salvation by, by, by faith or by works, or I would almost rather point to repentance. <laughs> And not only repentance, but continual repentance. That's right. And so there's a real sense in which the way the Eastern Church Fathers talk, and this is, I first noticed this in Athanasius of Alexandria. There's a real sense in which the way they talk about life and death is more like physics than it is like judicial predicaments. When the way... When you say judicial, you're talking about law language. Yep. Yep, and so there's a real sense in which, you, you know, oftentimes people will ask, well, why didn't God just do this or do that, you know, with regard to the fall or with Adam and Eve wanting to make them perfect from the outset, all these sorts of questions. And oftentimes in the West, there's not great answers to those because you're thinking of it through this framework of, well, it's God, he can do whatever he wants, right? Whereas what I noticed in Athanasius of Alexandria was he was really willing to say, um, you know, creatures are inherently, not even God can make, this is the entire point of the Arian dispute, is to say not even God can make a creature that's innately of itself, incorruptible, immortal. He can't make a second God. Hmm. And so the only way a creature could ever become, transcend its own limitations and become those things is to participate in God. And then that what that sets up is not a matter of, God punishing people for walking away from him, but rather something that, that can't be bypassed even by God himself, which is that if I walk away from him, I begin to die because he's the source of life. And only by being turned back to him can mm -hmm. I ever begin to live. And this, is, and, and this is why Athanasius, when he's asking, well, you know, why doesn't God just say, well, let the creatures die then? And he actually says it would be unworthy of God, unworthy of God, to let demonic schemes destroy his creation. He essentially says that God, being who he is, being good, willing your good, willing your good, willing my good, willing life, uh, it's, it would be unworthy of him. It would be contrary to his nature to just let us die. And this is why the incarnation is a relentless pursuit, even if he has to become one of us mm -hmm. in order to restore us and turn us back to God. And so when you begin to look at it this way and you start to say, well, why do, why does, why do we die? Right? And the answer is not because God's vindictive and he's just so offended that he needs to strike, strike you dead. 
but rather it's what Basil of Caesarea says, which is that Adam was immediately out of paradise by his own choosing. And by paradise, he didn't mean a place, he meant his communion with God. That was paradise. Wherever he went was paradise, because he was in communion with God. And by turning away from that, he was immediately outside of paradise and brought death upon himself, right? And so looking at it in that light, then what you're talking about is it's really a more basic question of saying, is it possible for me to retreat from God, to imbibe poison, to refuse medicine, and live? We're not talking about doing a bunch of peccadillos in order to appease God so that he'll end up rewarding us on, on the other side or something like that. We're talking about there is a way to life and there is a road to death. And which one do you want to walk? The way to life, we cut ourselves off from, but God opened back up. But you still have to walk it. And if you don't want to, that's still, that's your prerogative. You can embrace death. Many do. Right? but God continually tries to turn you back to the road to life. Not that you're unclear in any way, but I think it re uh, deserves reiteration, maybe going at it uh, again and again to drive this point home. So the first thing you said is, is it faith? Is it works? Is it uh, God's imputed righteousness? Is it uh, God's infused righteousness? Mm -hmm. And you said, I'm not taking the bait. Right. You said, essentially, that Christ is the balm of Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. So mm -hmm. the problem is that sin, as it were, you're communicating a I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I want you to either say what I'm saying is true or is not true. So far, so sin good. is a is a sickness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a disease, and Christ is the medicine of immortality that that heals that disease. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of on? That's right. That's right, and, and so it's not a question of, do I need to do this, this, and this in order to appease God? It's a question of, what is the road to life? Yeah. And Christ has laid that out, right? He's laid out the, in his teachings, in his example, uh, and in his work on our behalf. He's opened up that road to life. And this is what's interesting. When you look at the Desert Fathers, and people come to them and say, what must I do to be saved? They'll say, you know the gospel. And then they'll recite Christ's teaching. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him on your left. And it's not because they're suggesting that these are things that you need to do in order to earn God's favor. Rather, they're saying, this is what life looks like, as opposed to the way of death, that prior to turning to Christ, you indulged fully. I, I think you should write. A, I think you should write a book. <laughs> and I think we both of us should threaten him if he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> because, because things you're sharing is so significant for the whole world to read it. I mean, there's there there there's so many other things we want to talk about. Yeah. I mean, not, maybe even write about. I don't know. I'm not going to write another book. But but I I will tell you this that. And Nathan, he's both of, both of you are younger than I am, um, but 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 Nathan probably will write some more books. I'm older than you. Look at my beard. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're slightly younger, actually, yeah. just by a month or so. But you know, w there's another thing that I want to talk about, and and and, and that is um, the Bible itself. Um, there's there's a big debate in the Western church about the Orthodox. We can't be part of certain associations in certain circumstances because we don't say that the Bible is the only repository for redemptive revelation. Uh, we say with a different emphasis that it is the church that gave us the Bible. And we put the emphasis on church. And we talked about this last time. Uh, St. Paul says that the church 
is the ground and the pillar of truth. So the church gives us the Bible. Uh, the church gives us the faith once for all delivered to the uh, saints. So Jesus gave it to the disciples. He chose 12 men that they should be with him. He invested his life in them. These apostles now uh, pass on the faith to the apostolic fathers, men like Polycarp of Smyrna and uh, Ignatius of Antioch and Clement of Rome and so forth, these apostolic fathers, um, some of whom learned directly from the apostles, Polycarp from John and Ignatius of Antioch from John and Peter, uh, they pass on the faith. Then you have the era of the great apologists like Irenaeus. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and then you have the, the, the pre- and post-Nicene fathers. And, 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 and they're passing on a faith that is believed everywhere, always, and by all. So the Orthodox say that holy tradition is not an independent instance. It's not a complementary source of faith, but it's a way of rightly understanding the faith once for all delivered. But I think the problem is <clears throat> like... You know, my nearly six years of seminary and studying and everything, the, the history of the church goes back to Martin Luther. <laughs> and um, um, By the way, let me say, without throwing you off track here, you know, when we talk about deification, Martin Luther said that word became flesh, yeah, so that flesh yeah, might exactly. become word, but anyway. Exactly. The, the, the difficulty for most people, like me, well, some time ago, didn't understand the New Testament was canonized by the church in AD 395. So the question, for nearly 400 years, how did the church survive in the midst of no less than 80 major cults? How did? Because the apostles taught. Jesus never told the apostles write uh, gospels or anything. So when the when God when the scripture says they were moved by the Holy Spirit, that means, like when I study Greek, my professor said, well, if you want to know how educated Paul was, study, read his writings. If you want to know um, 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 a street man who spoke Greek, read Peter. But God used both of them, guiding their thoughts and everything. So. We, we have, the church was led because no one in the New Testament or prophets were alone representing the people of God. They were part of the people of God. And so they wrote down these things and then out of hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, the church was led to select those 27 and canonized it. And Nicene Creed, as a matter of fact, was uh, created in AD 325. Uh, leaders from all over the world gathered in Nicaea to uh, agonize over the Christology, the, you know, the Athanasius, you know, the whole story. So people don't understand that we are not saying God's word is not God's word or um, this Bible contains God's word or it's infallible, everything we confess. But um, for example, um, you know, I, I was born and raised and you know, in a tiny village in the southern part of India where St. Thomas came in AD 52 and established seven churches in, in that area before he was murdered. And as far as I know in my reading and understanding, you ask the question, divine liturgy, the, the um, consecration of the bread and the wine, who, who created it? Of course, we say we have clear documentation from AD 400 or later. But the truth is, I ask the question, how did our people in my state doing it from the very first century? The cardinal part of the divine liturgy was always there. So how did, how, how did we get it? I can tell you how we got it. Um, you know, St. James, the brother of Christ, not I mean his real flesh brother, um, was the chief apostle, the apostle in Jerusalem. And he must have seen and know 
heard, seen, touched, and tasted how Jesus, the methodology, the method, when he said Jesus gave thanks, what did he say? Thank you, 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 or just like a, a mandram or a sacred saying. Mm -hmm. Did he say certain um, uh, prayers um, seeking the Father uh, to do this? That's exactly what you have in the divine liturgy, mm -hmm. the Orthodox. And so, I have this argument, people may not agree with me, that we had this divine liturgy, the non-negotiable part of the divine liturgy, not written in the scripture. But it is demonstrated by, um, for example, baptism. How do we baptize people? It's, a, it, it, um, it, it's an impossible thing to figure out how people interpret things instead of reading the scripture. That is, how do we know the baptism? Well, you know, 3,000 people were baptized that day. You think every one of them were taken and dunked in the river? And mass people's movement in Europe, how did that happen? I mean, it's, I mean the whole country. So, you know, the, the, the holy traditions of the church actually help us to understand um, how to do it, like I say... Um, like the Didache. Yeah, yeah, you know, so this is, so the holy traditions are not opposing the scripture, it is affirming it. Mm -hmm. It is helping us. And sometimes people are confused. Actually, the New Testament church or Jewish convert is a continuum of the Old Testament because Isaiah 6, you see the worship of, I mean, real worship on earth is it's a, it's a mere, mere, mirror image of what happens in heaven. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 6, then you go to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, I mean, it's seven, eight hundred years of difference, one Old Testament, one New Testament, and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, the everything of the, the, I mean, this is my biggest problem. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be, the prophecy in Genesis. What happened to churches? They gather to a man to hear his preaching and teaching. I went to a church to speak some years ago, 40,000 number they're supposed to have, and um, I, I was on the radio in that community for Lever, and uh, in, it's in Florida. Um, and I was surprised they didn't announce my name that I'm coming to speak there, because we have tons of friends in the community. And when I asked um, the, one of the leaders there, I uh, wish he announced it, at least we could have done it. He said, oh, um, if you announce it, 40% um, of the people will not show up. I said, I, I said, did I do anything wrong? He said, no, 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 they want, they, they want to hear our pastor teach. So why do all these people come? A German man did a PhD um, on church growth in America, and it was given to me by David Maines in Chicago, and that shows 85% of church growth in America is people moving from one church to another church. Not people living in the community and, and caring for the lost and, and undone and this and that. So what I'm trying to say basically is that there's a, there's a huge gap in understanding the, the, the holy tradition and we have rejected. That's the reason why there's so much disrespect. Um, you know, people come, uh, it's unbelievable. They, they, they gather a man, if he's not there, they don't show up, and the Holy Communion is taken, you know, you know sitting carelessly. And, um, um, and, but if the President of the United States come to see them, you think they will go uh, in, um, um, you know, whole, jeans with the holes and, you know, and um, weird looking um, appearance? No. We don't even have any respect for God, um, the respect we give to a policeman. And this has to do uh, with not understanding our five senses and res respectful behavior. Um, um, and this, this reflected in the, in, the, in the Christianity at large. Anyway, my, my whole idea is that what uh, Hank, you said, you know, church gave the Bible, it is good for people to keep in mind this canonized uh, New Testament we had nearly 8,400, 8, and 400 years or so church survived through the teaching and the holy traditions they embraced. Maybe a good uh, few minute rejoinder, I mean, because we're almost out of time, but... Um, yeah, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I... 
th this is not a conversation that you put anybody to sleep I and mean, we're talking about something very, very significant. Uh, the, the, the fact that the church gives us the Bible and as KP rightly said, I mean, it wasn't until 367 that uh, you have the festal letter mm -hmm. that gives us for the first time 27 mm -hmm. books of the Bible um, as a canon, and it wasn't actually embraced in toto for, for a long time after that. So the church gives us the Bible, and there's a period of time where the Bible isn't, I mean, uh, as I understand it, uh, the, the letter, uh, the first letter of uh, Clement was bound with 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. for, for many years in the, in, in the early church as the letters were circulating uh, in the early church. So it is the church that is the ground and pillar of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can comment on that. And, and, and one other thing I want to say, and, and that is just to underscore what KP was talking about. I mean, the church is not about innovation. It's about perpetuating mm -hmm. the faith mm -hmm. once for all delivered to the saints, meaning that much of what we do in the liturgy, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the worshipers, mm -hmm. Uh, much of what is done there is a perpetuation of what was done uh, in the synagogues with the reading of the word, mm -hmm. uh, with the homily. Uh, it, 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 it's being perpetuated. So it's not about innovation, it's about perpetuation. And a lot of what we know about how liturgy or how worship is to take place actually comes from other sources that are given to us through holy tradition, including what I alluded to earlier, uh, the Didache. Mm -hmm. um, your, your thoughts on this, and then we'll kind of wrap it up, but I, I, I do want to uh, talk next time we get together about, uh, about this whole idea of seven ecumenical councils and why Orthodox Church is called the Church of the Seven Ecumenical Councils and why it is said... Um, that orthodoxy is Catholicism without the additions and Protestantism without the subtractions. Is that a fair statement? And we, we can talk about that next. But So uh, uh, I think we've already touched on some aspects of this. But, you know, as you said, that, that the Bible is the book of the church. I actually remember... Uh, <laughs> One of, uh, one of my former students who became Orthodox and his, uh, his wife was also becoming Orthodox. It was actually before I was Orthodox. Uh, but um, but they, his, his wife's family had no idea what this was. What is this cult they're joining? <laughs> you know, they went in to talk to the priest about Orthodoxy and, and they asked, do you, do you believe in the Bible? And the priest <laughs> responded, believe it. We wrote it. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but what you do see is you do see in, in figures like Arenaeus, right? Disciple of Polycarp, disciple of John. Uh, that he actually does talk about with regard to the Gnostics when interacting with the Gnostics, uh, that they have a tendency to manipulate the Bible and turn it into certain things. And Irenaeus's recourse to that is not to say, um, well, here's, here's the syntax and why that's, that's not a viable interpretation. His recourse is he actually uses this analogy of, of, a, of a mosaic, where he suggests, well, what the Gnostics do is they essentially come in and they take these tiles that make an image of Christ and they go, no, 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 look, right? Jeez, and they shuffle, actually, right, yeah. right. And we, we move them around and they say, look, a dog. See, Christ is a dog. <laughs> and here it says, well, that's, that's absurd because we, we know who Christ is. We know he's not a dog. And so Irenaeus is... So they rearrange the jewels uh -huh. and the king begins to look like a dog. That's right. And Irenaeus' response isn't, you know, to some sort of, you know... Uh, humanist methodology of recovering the meaning of the text or something like that. It's an appeal to the fact that we already know what Christianity is. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and when Irenaeus talks about this, he actually does talk about the fact um, that we did these things before they were written down. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and of course they had the Old Testament, but when you're talking about the New Testament practices, there's a gap there. 
and, and they did it. They knew what Christianity was. They knew how they did it. And as you pointed out, you can actually see in the liturgy, right? You can see the, the Jewish synagogue liturgy, and you can see where the break is, and then you can see where uh, basically the, you know, the Eucharistic liturgy, which was done separately until they were put out of the synagogues, you can see how those things are assembled, and you see the, the parallels with, with temple worship. But uh, there, is, there is nonetheless the recognition that there is something that we do, something that we've been doing. And for that reason, all of the Eastern Fathers had always had an understanding that the apostles handed down things by word of mouth and by epistle. And Paul tells us to abide by whatever has been handed down, right? Paradisus, tradition, to hand it down. Uh, by word of mouth or by epistle. And people like Basil of Caesarea say explicitly, they say, if we just limited what we do to whatever the apostles happen to have occasion to write down because of some controversy, there's all sorts of things we would stop doing. We'd stop praying facing east, we'd stop crossing ourselves, and he names all of, the, he names all of these things that, of course, after the Protestant Reformation with Sola Scriptura, they did stop doing. I think this is a great place to end. I mean, in 189, as you say, I mean, you have Irenaeus pointing out apostolic tradition, apostolic succession as the chief means by which we can tell the difference between the real, genuine Orthodox Church and a counterfeit. And, of course, he was, at that time, dealing with the Gnostics and secret knowledge and the fact that Jesus' body was a phantom and so forth. I want to end. We only have about two minutes. Um, I want to end with you. Uh, you're one of the great storytellers, uh, stories that are impactful, uh, stories that resonate with us. And one of the stories you told me that I always think about, um, and we'll pick this up next time, but you talk about going back to the church when the church was young. If you can end us with the anecdote that you used when you were a young boy, yeah, and you used to jump off the coconut trees or whatever it was into the river. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the good memories I have. You know, I was born and raised by a river, and so our home was by the river bank. And, of course, the, the main cultivation there is rice and coconut trees. And so we have this massive number of coconut trees, and many of them that are planted by the side of the river, they, they grow over the river for the sunlight. And so as little boys, we used to, I mean, we climb on half a way to the coconut, maybe uh, you know, 50 or 100 you know, feet, and then jump into the river, and the river, you, from the top of the coconut tree, maybe uh, 50 meters high, you can see the bottom of the river. Absolutely clean, clear, the sand down there. And we used to jump and swim all the time. But then, in the entire three kilometers of the river, there was maybe three, four houses. There was no other houses. The, the, the water was absolutely pure. But after I spent... 20 years away from my home and Europe and America and everything, and I went back, I was in absolute shock. The river looked so polluted. Literally, I didn't want to wash my hand in the river. What happened, all along the side of the river, both sides, people began to build these houses, and all the waste being dumped in the river. And the water, you cannot anymore take bath in the river. It's so polluted. And I, I say... This happened to the church. Why do you think one holy church now recognized over 50,000 denominations, everyone claiming they got the right church? And this pollution, we cannot fix it, but we can go back to the fountainhead, the, the, the mountain where the river starts, and by the way, this is a real thing. I have asked people to check for me because I didn't have time to go. They went and said, you can't believe it. The way the river starts, it is still perfectly clean, fish, plants, everything beautiful. But down the line, so 2,000 years of the river, the history of the church, we have some... Man has become the biggest enemy of the church. So we're... we're, we're uh Sorry, just no, because no, of no, time, no. but uh, so, uh, just, I mean, that's 
great way to end. I mean, this you're talking, we're, we're talking essentially, and we'll talk about this next time, we're talking about going back to when the church was young. And uh, th th this is the essence of what we're talking about. And a lot of people don't know about the history of the church. They may know back to the Reformation, but they don't know from the Reformation back to the time of the apostles and the apostolic fathers and so forth. This has been a great discussion. I've learned a lot from listening to you and always listening to you. I appreciate the friendship and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.